Um, morning, everyone. So, um, and, and thanks for uh, having me here. So, uh, I am not sure if I'm the only chemical engineer in the gathering here. So, I'll be talking to you a bit about uh, growth instabilities that we have been observing in our experiment crystallization. Uh, most of this work is done by my Yago Swami. Um, so, um, you must be aware of uh, several, of course, ice crystals, snowflakes is something that we all know about. And um, there is a lot of literature on crystallization in melts. Um, so, this is an image of a succinonitrile crystal growing from its melt. And uh, there was literature by Glixman, Langer, and many others about uh, the instabilities formed during growth of these crystals. Um, this is a movie of uh, a brine solution being evaporated and the crystals being form formed. And quickly, this sort of spreading solution forms a, a sort of a network of crystals as shown here. Because, uh, it's, these sort of systems are seen in alloys, metallic glasses, polymers, biological systems all over the place. And can be theoretically understood by phase field models. There are many, many, many ways of understanding them. So uh, what we are doing is, uh, is, uh, is crystallizing from solutions instead of melts. And so before I go to our, my experiments, I want to just sort of show what, what sort of broadly uh, is the understanding. So this is the classic mullin sakarka type instability growth in a temperature gradient. And here what happens is that if this crystal is growing in a gradient, and if there is a bulge here, then the, uh, the tip experiences a steeper gradient and therefore grows faster, whereas the crest does the opposite, and hence the instability grows. That's a very um, sort of quick way of thinking about it. And if you sort of think about how this instability is quantified, uh, typically one would plot the growth velocity versus tip radius. And um, in some cases, you expect this. Um, this to go as an inverse rule, and in some cases, the velocity would decrease with tip radius to a power of min power of two. Yeah, so uh, you can, I guess, there's a lot of literature by Langer and others on this. So uh, we are observing something different. So I'll just walk you through our experiments. So what we do is we take stearic acid. It's a long chain carboxylic acid shown here, and uh, we dissolve this in mineral oil and we cool the solution. Okay. So stearic acid forms uh, a crystal uh, where the carbon chains are all aligned with each other. And this is what the molecular arrangement in a C polymorph of stearic acid looks like. That's the polymorph we are concentrating on. Uh, what we do is to this two component system, we add a third component, which is a surfactant. It's soluble in the oil phase. And essentially, we um, we, if this is the solubility graph, we start at a higher temperature and then cool it. So as we cool, the solubility line is crossed and crystallization uh, begins somewhere here. So um, our experiments are pretty simple. We just have a glass slide. We drop a heated solution onto it and observe the crystals growing uh, for different ranges of supersaturation as well as uh, surfactant concentration. Um, so the typical shape of a stearic acid crystal C polymorph is this rhombic platelet. And we see that when there is no surfactant present. Uh, but we, when we add a surfactant, what we see is that the crystal grows like a rhombic plate initially, but then its shape deforms. You can see it by the um, edges getting flatter here. And um, there are other interesting things about the nucleation induction time and so on, which, which I won't have the time to go through. But one thing I wanted to point out here is that if you sort of track the growth of these crystals over time, if we compare the without surfactant and the with surfactant case, then the growth rates are much slower in the case with surfactant. So you can know the time scales here. They're about 10 times that on the left hand side. Um, and um, more details in this paper, but uh, what is important is that the surfactant has these hydrophilic um, ends and stearic acid crystals from the edges have these carboxylic groups that are exposed and so these two polar 
entities should attract each other and that might explain why this change in growth occurs. Um, if we let the experiment run for a long time, slowly what happens is that we see this sort of fingers appear on top of the crystals and they seem to be periodic in some sense. And I initially thought it is just secondary nucleation that's happening over very, very long times. But this happens only when additive is added. So what we did next is we start, started increasing the concentration of the additive that we are using. And we observed a whole range of interesting structures being formed. So A, B, C, D here are just uh, increasing orders, increasing concentrations of our surfactant. So I'll just play these videos for you. In this video, you can see that there is some remnant of that rhombic platelet, but then there are these side things that are growing from the edges. Uh, if we increase the additive concentration further, the rhombic plate almost stops growing immediately after forming, and you get these long tentacles forming. You increase it further, and you now see a tree-like fractal growing. And uh, even further, you get this periolytic like growth. So uh, the things to note are that uh, the thicknesses of these uh, projections are becoming finer and finer as the additive concentration is increasing. And we also see some interesting uh, things about that the tip velocity seems to be uh, growing faster. So uh, we then quantify the, um, we quantify these uh, statistics. So on the graph, on the left is a graph of tip velocity versus the additive concentration. And we find that um, the, uh, cons the velocity is increasing quite rapidly with the level of surfactant added. And if you plot the tip radius, now these are, uh, you know, very fine crystals, so the error bars are high, but you can clearly see that the tip radius is decreasing with uh, the surfactant concentration. Now, uh, the spherulites, spherulites are not there in this picture because they are just so fine that we are not able to track them um, using our microscope. But the uh, other systems are all there and they are all at a fixed concentration of the solute, which is stearic acid. Uh, now, if we combine the two plots, that is, we now plot tip velocity versus tip radius, which is sort of the kind of plots we see for melt crystallization literature. Um, we see that velocity is decreasing uh, with the tip radius with a slope of minus 3. And that is different from the uh, scalings that are observed for melt crystallization. So um, uh, the mechanisms that we are observing here must uh, therefore be uh, quite different from that. So um, I won't have time to go through. Uh, OK. So. Um, let me just um so um, just wanted to highlight that if we do this now for uh, different levels of stearic acid present, now sigma here is the level of supersaturation, so it's just uh, a concentration divided by solubility minus 1. So if you do that for different sigmas, we are still getting a similar scaling, and likewise for tip radius versus the fact and concentration when observed for different sigmas that um, indicates that there is some universality to, to these results. Um, uh, there is something also interesting happening with the frequency at which the branches are splitting. So if you look at the branch splitting distance versus uh, surfactant concentration, again we see some sort of a power law showing up. Of course, uh, the spherulites are nowhere there because they would feature somewhere here on the graph uh, if you were to plot them. Um, so with that, I would sort of just go to my summary and conclusion slide. So um, of course, we don't understand this completely. Um, uh, one thing is sure that the additive dampens the growth rate. And we know that it promotes, uh, because the growth rates are slower, secondary nucleation takes over. Um, we have confirmed experimentally that secondary nucleation is what gives rise to this branching, because we see um, you know, bright spots at the nodes and across polarizers. 
but uh, the that the mechanism must be different from mel solidification is what we think and uh, some of the theoretical ideas that we are exploring have to do with adsorption of additives on the faces or maybe convective effects that are brought into these systems so i'll stop here and i'm happy to take any questions the patterns uh, that you observe uh, could could it be explained uh, using reaction diffusion equations some of those fingering patterns uh, so um, so um, are you referring to the kind of reaction diffusion equations that are uh, you know um, used in biological systems and this probably they could be but then uh, if i were to sit down and write the equations for these I'll get equations very similar to the melt crystallization systems, right? Except the boundary condition would be different. So I could even use that approach for uh, and do a linear stability analysis on it and 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 get there. So the thing about this is that I could th there are multiple ways of explaining this. There are phase field models as well. So you, you mentioned stability analysis. So if you did a stability analysis with this additional solute species, this surfactant present and without it, I mean, what's the difference? What do you find at that level? I haven't, I haven't tried got, it yet. got that far yet. I see. Yes, I'm still working on it. I see. But our experimental results are. are right, I see. So could one, dif sorry, what, could one difference between this and the melt situation be that surface diffusion is suppressed? And that's why you also see these uh, long, uh, things sort of growing uh, because if, as you add the additive the surface diffusion could be suppressed maybe um, um, I'm not sure I'm not sure but why would you why do you think it would be because you're adding something else and that's why you will not sort of retain those uh, rhomboidal shapes and you can have these pointed things going out of the specific points well, um, yeah, so one thing that um, I, I, I frankly, I don't know the answer to that. But one of the things that I think I should have mentioned is the fact that the crystals are still just the solute, right? So none of the additive gets incorporated into the crystal. So when we are thinking about uh, how, what are the concentrations that are present for the additive in the solution outside the crystal, as the crystal is growing, it's actually throwing the additive out, right? So just outside the crystal, you will expect a hump in the additive concentration. And the boundary condition for the additive would be that of a flux being thrown out from the crystal, right? So uh, that's that's one thing that's happening, right? So right, uh, right, sort of beyond the growth front, there is a lot of additive which is out there. And uh, the other thing which I didn't show, and I'm sorry about that, is that uh, the solubility is a function of the additive concentration, right? So if the sorry, I mean the additive concentration changes then uh, solubility would get affected and that could play, I think gets back to your question, it would play a role in the linear stability analysis. But we haven't gone that far actually. <laughs>